We talk about the beauty of sound meeting the magnificence of stone in this place. And I think when people come here and hear an instrument like this, they are tied into centuries of musical history. They feel a sense of that, but they also feel a sense of this thing that is bigger than themselves. I mean, where else in Chicago do you have an organ like this? You don't. There are other big cathedrals, but this is a pretty special place, it really is. And an instrument like this has to have someone who plays it and who knows it intimately. Thomas Weisflan. I've been the university organist here at Rockefeller Chapel, the University of Chicago, since October 1st, 2000. He comes and touches and cares for this thing and caresses it and makes sure it's in good shape and puts it to bed at night and generally loves it and looks after it. My formal education in many respects uh, has been in chemistry and physics and I was actually working on a PhD a degree here at the University of Chicago in chemical physics and I eventually just my interest was lost in that and I spent more and more time here at Rockefeller Chapel on this organ. I actually studied organ with the then university organist Edward Mondello and um, I switched from science to music. The original organ, the contract was signed in February 1927 with Ernest M. Skinner Organ Company, very famous American builder, for uh, a totally brand new organ at the time, uh, $76,500, believe it or not. It had 108 sets of pipes. Um, back then in the 1950s, two more were added in the gallery organ. And with the rebuilding process, the organ now boasts 132 sets of pipes, with a total number of pipes of 8,565, with speaking lengths of over 32 feet, down to a speaking length of 3 eighths of an inch. Obviously, the shorter pipes are the higher pitch, the long pipes are the very low pitch. After I arrived in 2000, we actually had to shut the organ down the following January. Many, many notes did not play. Water had leaked in through the window over the organ as well as through drains in the roof that were leaking. Um, electrical problems, you name it and it had to be totally rebuilt. This should not be a piecemeal project, just do it right and do it all at once. So it was just finding money, which took several years. We did a lot of research. We have archival records here in the basement and in Regenstein Library. We found some of the original correspondence on this organ. So in other words, not only did we restore this organ and enlarge it a bit, we also improved it. So this organ, as you see, has four keyboards plus a fifth keyboard for the feet. The top keyboard is the solo organ with wonderful solo sounds like a French horn and every time I pull a draw knob and it's labeled French horn brings that set of organ pipes into play. The next keyboard down is the swell organ which actually has some pipes up here in the front and some in the back. Then this keyboard, the great organ, is the backbone of the organ. It has the diapasons, which are a tone that does not seek to imitate any orchestral instrument. It's pure organ tone. And then the choir organ, with the softest stop on the organ, is here. And then the most fun of all, the pedal division that has the bass. By itself, it's almost a little grotesque, but by the time you put a lot of organ under it, and 
And you notice I occasionally push buttons, these numbered buttons. This is called the combination action. And you can preset them uh, to remember combinations of stops that you want. It's just a dream to, to uh, one, be given the privilege to design and help a restoration of something like this, and then to play it on an ongoing basis. It's a very colorful organ. Um, it's just a dream, absolute dream. So I, do, I don't plan on leaving. <laughs>